You're listening to Garibaldi Red, a Nottingham Forest podcast brought to you by Nottinghamshire Live. Hello and welcome to Garibaldi Red, Nottingham Forest podcast, Nottinghamshire Live. My name is Matt Davis, hosting as usual, and I'm delighted to be joined today by former Reds midfielder returning to the show, David Prutton. Hello, Prutton. How are you? I'm very well, Matt. You look very well, and I'm looking forward to this wonderful trio that we've put together today, which you can now reveal who the final one is. Yes, also back on the show. The most popular fan guest we've had, I'm sure he won't enjoy me saying, uh, is Reds fan Mikey Clark. Mikey, morning. Are you well? Morning. Yeah, I'm great, Matt. How are you? Yes, good. I had my jab yesterday, as we were saying, my second one, and not feeling too bad. So uh, it could have been a lot worse. Obviously, very happy to get that. So, yes. Where shall we start? Uh, I was going to start away from Forest, actually, and talk about the absolute misery of Sunday night (laughs) with England. (laughs) And just get people's thoughts on that. Edging towards a question about Forest uh, in terms of would you rather Forest did this or England did that, which we'll come to. But Prutz, just from a former Hmm. player's point of view, while we wait for people to join us on Facebook, were England deservedly beaten? What, What did you make of it all? I think so, yeah. Over the course of uh, the way that the game panned out, going into extra time and penalties, it was quite obviously a wonderful start. Um, and then as the game kind of progressed and we saw how good Italy were, it, 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 there was elements of familiarity that I think would unease um, England fans with regard to not really kind of hammering home the advantage that we had. Yes, it's a young team. Uh, yes, uh, there is... Absolute progression if you go from a World Cup semi-final to uh, the final of the next major tournament. But still some question marks. I think that the more, I mean, we might touch on it, of course, but the disgraceful kind of reaction to what's happened, completely blown um, out of proportion when it comes to talking about a football match and the, the integrity, the class, the humility of the team that he's put together is echoed by the manager. And I think they're a very, very, very likeable national team for us to be very, very proud of. Um, and within that, the football and decisions, um, using players that haven't had too much game time for the biggest moments. And I was staggered by the fact that you come off the back and, and obviously everyone's an expert after the event. And I, and I do thoroughly understand that. But when you look at the likes of Saka not taking a, a penalty in, in senior football, it, you, you, um, you, Staggered to hear that at such a such a vital time of, of such a vital game. But these decisions have been made. Gareth's taken full responsibility for it. And it, once again, I think it's incremental improvement, but plenty of things to work on going into the next major tournament. Uh, Mikey, my question to you then is, what hurts more, do you think, Forest losing in the playoffs or England losing on Sunday? Where would you sit on that from a Forest fan's point of view? Which playoffs is my first one? <laughs> the ones where Putz got sent off. Um, ah, how, how on earth have you managed to do that? that I mean, to get inside it three that minutes. Within three minutes. I mean, Matt, I mean, you, you're getting more efficient with that. It's wonderful. <laughs> the, uh, which one hurt the most? Uh, Blackpool? Sheffield United? For me, yeah. For, I teed you up there, Matt, didn't I? No, for me, it was uh, Sheffield United. It could be, I was thinking about this, it could be something to do with my age, because at the time, what was that, uni maybe, just coming out, um, everything felt quite rural then, you know, watching it in a pub, you know, doing, you know, getting really involved and being 2 0 up with, what, 20 minutes to go um, in the second leg. So 3 1 up in aggregate and not going through. That was, I remember coming out of that feeling quite devastated. I guess if you compare that to, to Sunday, I'll be honest with you, all through the tournament, I was quite calm in talking to friends and, and family. I think. Don't know whether it's because of of the year, year and a half people have had, but I think everybody was just quite relaxed about it. Just wanted to see how things would go. But as the momentum built through the tournament, and certainly as we got into Sunday, and you go one nil up after two minutes, it really kicked in then for me. I start to get very, very nervous at that point. And I think the team did as well, because we almost sort of thought, well, we've got eighty eight minutes. If we don't concede, mm-hmm. we're European champions. And it, and it seemed to have that effect on them, that early goal. So I think we do we do what we've done in the past in previous tournaments, which is try and hold on to a lead. It didn't work. Penalties is a lottery. Um, you know, Prutz was saying around the penalty, the choice of penalty takers, I also found that quite bizarre. But I guess in answer to your question, Matt, I was more devastated at Forest playoff losses, probably all of them. Um but there was that point on Sunday, just after eight o'clock, where you thought, oh, this could be it. And I guess 
I was saying to somebody, <laughs> um, I almost would have rather have lost 3 0 in the final. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> get that close and be one mm. or two and leading in the penalty shootout as well. Don't forget that we were actually winning that um, at one stage. It was just so close and then to be, be snatched away. Um, I've spoken to a few people afterwards. A lot of them seem to be still gutted, understandably. I think I'm all right about it, personally. I'm, I'm focusing towards Forest for next season, uh, and hopefully we can get in the playoffs and do one better than what we've just talked about. Yeah, let's talk about Forest then. They've signed a player. Before we before we arranged this, I was getting a bit panicked. We'd have nothing to talk about other than are you panics? But now they have signed someone <laughs> in Ethan Horvath, the, the American goalkeeper who's 26, uh, he is played for his country. He had some time at Molde and uh, went to Club Bruges and was number one there for a few years, but lost his place more recently to Simon Mignolet. And he's only played a handful of games in two years, but he's 26 and Forrest signed him on a three-year contract. Um, Mikey, you're the, you're the Forest fan. I mean, what did you make of it when you saw it announced late last night? Yeah, I'll be honest. I've, I've never heard of him <laughs> before. So I'm having to do a bit of research. Now. Always a good start. <laughs> It is, isn't it? Yeah. Um, if you if you look at I guess his career and you can only go on, you know what you read on the internet and what, and what you see, um, he looks a solid keeper. You know, he's, he's he's played in I think the Norwegian league under Solskjaer, as you were saying, for a few years. Um, then going to Bruges, I think, only losing his place to Minulay. And let's not, you know, the the Champions League final was a disaster for Mignolet. But other than that, he's a pretty good keeper. You know, I think he's been Belgian number two for numerous years now. So losing your place to him is not, you know, uh, besmirchment on, you know, Horvath's, you know, uh, skill. Um, so I'll be interested to see what he brings to the team. Like I said, I don't know much about him. But I think one thing that most people will agree of is um, Samba, as brilliant as he's been, hasn't necessarily been pushed for that number one spot. Um, you know, Jordan Smith is, by all accounts, a very popular member of the squad um, and he's a decent backup and plays the odd cup game. Um, but I think, didn't he go to Mansfield a couple of years ago and struggled to break into that team? So I think if you put if you put two and two together, what is this new guy? He's 26. Um, I think he's played six or seven times for his country uh, quite recently as well. I think he's only played sort of half a dozen times in the last two years for his club, as, as we spoke about. There are mitigating reasons for that. So I think 26 is a good age for a keeper. So he signed a three-year deal. So even if things don't work out, he's going to be 28, 29. And I guess any sort of sell-on fee for a keeper at that age is probably more than you get for an, an outfield player. Because, you know, Prutz will tell me if I'm completely barking up the wrong tree here, but keepers seem to get better as they get older, from from what I can see. Yeah, so, uh, that's... It's, so, it's... Uh, the, the, uh, the great thing with, with the way that Mike is talking there is with real balance and perspective because um, there, there would be a certain bracket of supporter that would look at the theme and go, who? And then instantly dismiss him. So therefore, he's coming into somewhere where he's operating on the back foot. Um, but I think you've, you've got to be broad-minded enough to think, well, I'll make the judgment with my own eyes as and when I see him. And if he pushes Samba, if he manages to elbow Samba out of the way and is part of a defence. As we know, we, we we talk so much about the way Chris likes to set a team up to give them a solid platform. I love the way we talk about that. Like it's, um, like it's genuinely mind-blowing that if we concede less and score more, we might have more chance of winning football matches as packaged up as being pragmatic or things like that. So it's, it sounds basically common sense, doesn't it? So if he's part of a defence that is tough to break down and, and particularly at home able to, to turn... Um, the city ground into a place where teams that want to go, then it'll be the perfect signing. But it's it, the, anybody, even if you get a, 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 a known name, and we spoke about Anthony Knockout coming into the side and um, raving about what he could do at this level. But the proof is in the pudding. He's got to come in and perform, and and, and he, he starts off on a level footing with everyone else. I think. Um. It's an interesting thing. I don't have any insight on this. People asking if Bree Sam is moving on, but Olympiakos' goalkeeper is Jose Sarr, who's about to join Wolves. So I don't know. Fans are going to put two and two together there, and mm. I don't have any insight on that. But there is always that that wonderment there about Samba um, moving on. Sam asks if it's a Dane Murphy signing. I suppose it might well be. You put two and two together, it's an American signing with an American CEO coming in, and it would make sense and fit the mould of 
players Forrest have been linked with as well. What do you make of the three-year contract, Mikey? That was the only thing that struck me, that Forrest have had this knack of handing out long contracts to players who then go on and do very little. It's a bit different with the keeper because only one can play, but that was the only curious thing that struck me about it. Yeah, it's, it's a good point. I think it, it struck me as well. You know, just before I answer that, Matt, going back to what you were saying about Americans, I was thinking about other Americans that have played for the club. So obviously Robbie Finlay, John Hawks. I'm struggling to think of other ones other than that. They might Lee be one. I, Ben Olsen. Of course, yeah. Oh, Ben Olsen, yeah, of course. Um, so I think we average one every 10 years, and I guess Glorious you do put ben two Olsen, and two together. Yeah. Mm. Did you play with him? Do you know Ben Olsen, Prots? Ben, yeah, yeah, he, 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 uh, yeah, he, he came over and having covered quite a bit of MLS as he was in charge of uh, DC United for uh, the best part of a decade, even more. I think um, he was he was he was a really good lad, Ben. He came at a time when we needed a bit of a list, and he was very bright and bubbly. Got on like a house on fire with Jim Brennan, um, and obviously pioneered the shoulder length hairdo, which I shamelessly copied <laughs> in, in years to come, as, as I as I was wont to do. <laughs> Uh, sorry, Mikey, the three-year contract thing, I cut you off there. No, 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 it's fine. I, was, I knew I'd forgotten some Americans that play for us, so nice one. Um, yeah, surprised, I guess, but the, the more you have chance to think about it, you do think, you know, it, it'll probably come in as backup initially, and if he hits the ground running next season, then he's got two years left. And like I said, if we want to do a sell-on, then he may only have a year, 18 months in the first team. You think of it that way i guess with goalkeepers as well you do need a really really strong backup so uh i guess if they want to loan out players like smith and like uh shelby who i think has gone to, to mansfield as well you do need some experience in there and like i said matt you know he's he's played very recently for his country no shame in losing your place to, to belgium's number two at his club so i guess if you're weighing up the pros and cons it strikes me as as almost like a sensible, if not spectacular, start to the transfer business for this season. Now, I should correct myself here. I don't want to be accused of stirring the pot because I said about Olympiakos, apparently they've already signed a new goalkeeper, so I don't want to be accused of journalistic transfer mongering, so <laughs> I should correct myself there. Um, on the signing then, Prats, do you agree? I mean, with squads that you've played in, did you, re did you really need that? strong number two to push the goalie or was, was it sometimes you had someone who was such an established number one that you could get away with a, a young kid as a backup or something like that or a 40 year old that's never going to pull on the gloves um yeah i always thought that healthy competition was good because it's and it's it's quite unique with goalkeepers because they do spend uh, a lot of time doing very bespoke uh unique to them training and it's it's tough it's competitive and the best types of uh, dynamics as these goalkeepers pushing each other. Therefore, you end up with the one uh, who just edges ahead on a on a Saturday afternoon or a Tuesday night, or whenever it is, and hopefully they're chomping at the bit. I think it, it it does help to breed that type of culture within within the whole squad. I think, and as any as any dynamic of of men together in in a football team. You've all got your secret kind of choices. Oh, like I prefer him, or you I mean I've, I've got a bit more time for him. But fundamentally, it's about who's, who's going to perform when the pressure is going to be back on. Because the great thing, obviously, going into the season, as long as the next few months pan out how we want them to pan out, is um, we, these players have been judged from afar for such a long period of time. Now they're going to get back to that real visceral reaction of whether a goalkeeper comes and catches a cross, whether he shanks a clearance, whether he mistimes a challenge. And that's where the international experience may be of what Ethan's got will put him in good stead uh, as and when he gets in the side and keeps uh, Bryce as, as on the metal as he needs to be to make sure that he, he retains that spot in goal. Uh, last one on Horvath. I did have a question um, from a listener on Twitter. And if anyone's got any questions, do drop them in for Prutz and Mikey and we'll put them in in the Facebook comments as we go along. Uh, from Gareth Watts, who asked what kind of keeper he is. And I have to admit, like everyone else, I had to Google him, so I had no idea. So I've asked Eric Lehi and a Belgian football expert. And Eric got back and said he doesn't know him too well, apart from a training camp five years ago, but he's a really good guy. He would have been 21 at the time, so he's obviously evolved as a keeper. So I'm sorry I can't offer too much insight, but obviously we'll see more of him in the days and weeks to come. Um, Mikey, what else do Forest need then? They've been linked with Zinkenagel at Watford, 
Zian Fleming, uh, the attacking midfielder in, in Holland. I know you watch a bit of Dutch football. And um, Jack Clark's the other target that we kind of know about. I mean, what else do you think Forrest need now going forwards? Yeah, quite a bit, if, if I'm honest. Can I just touch on Fleming? Because I do watch a bit of Dutch football. Um, actually follow VVV Van Lee for those people that listen that know them. They're terrible. They're the team that lost 13-0. And, <laughs> and you're a Forest fan. Yeah, I don't know what that says about me. Um, so <laughs> I watched this uh, Fleming guy play against Venlo twice last season. And I think he scored in both games. So before anyone gets excited or anything, I think it's probably fair to say that the standard of the Dutch league outside of those sort of top four or five is probably high-end league one, I would have thought. Um, but this guy did stand out, um, very energetic, box-to-box, -box, obviously has, has a liking for a goal. Um and I think, you know, we were talking earlier on around um, getting players in who are, I say earlier on in a previous podcast, who are almost the right age, so can flourish mm. at risk, get better, and then potentially either, you know, help take us up or be moved on for, you know, for a profit to help us stay sustainable. And I think he very much fits into that mould from what I've seen of him. Like, like I said, it's only a couple of games, but he certainly impressed me and stood out. Um, and I think we need more of that, Matt. I think we need more more energy in the team, um, certainly in those sort of final final half, final third areas. We really struggled to create last season. Um, in fact, as soon as we went 1-0 down, I think everybody, everybody will probably agree that uh, it was a tough watch because we didn't necessarily mm. have the players in there to, to unpick that lock or to burst past a player and put the cross in or... You know, to get on the end of a cross, should I say? So it really needs freshening up. Um, all the loan players have gone back now, uh, but I guess the positive news is the ones that were out on loan from us have come back. So you, Brennan Johnsons, um, Gabriel, a few others. I'd like to see those guys in the team for youth and for energy. And I think recruitment this season, probably more than ever, is absolutely crucial. Because let's not forget, we're only a couple of couple of losses away from really being dragged down and there was a point in the season where we were in the bottom three and really struggling so it does need a bit of overhaul I think Prutz is right when he talks about solidity at the back I don't think there's too many problems that that side but I think only Derby scored less goals than his last season so it's pretty obvious where we, where we need um, some some solid and some thoughtful recruitment so I wouldn't like to see another 14 players come in or whatever it was last season mm. but I think I think six or seven energetic players who aren't afraid to be the man, who have that potential for a sell-on fee because we need to keep doing this season after season, window after window, I think will be a great start. So, yeah, I think, I think freshen up in the final third, Matt. The incoming CEO, perhaps Dane Murphy, mm. had this policy at Barnsley, we understand, of only signing players under 26. Obviously, you came through at Forest as a, as a clutch of very young players. What mm. Do you like the sound of that policy, especially with the way the championship is now in terms of transfers and developing players and selling them on? Does that work for you? Well, well I mean, if, if you look at the proof of, of what happened at Barnsley, it works. Obviously, it didn't actually help them climb out of the division in the way that they wanted, but that was a team... But that was a team as well that was allied to a certain way of playing uh, from a certain manager who um extremely strong-minded extremely um settled and, and comfortable in the way that he wanted to go about that football team and got the absolute maximum out of it and and when you do play um with that type of tempo that they did um, and that assault on the senses that barnsley was at times then you need the energy, you need the willingness of the players as well, because what happens is, and I'm, I'm not saying this is a blanket statement about about um, players as they get older, but if there's one hint or one sniff of things not being quite right, if you don't have the play, all the players on board, it can quite easily permeate throughout the rest of the squad. So you need everyone on board for a particular way of playing. I've always thought it was slightly easier with younger players. Again, that, that's a gross generalisation and not, and not absolutely relevant to every single football club that you're talking about, but I think age-wise, it's definitely something to be looked at. Mike is talking about Fleming, and I think what was good, again, when you, you have a little read-up about these players and the fact that, along with goals as assists as well, because it, it kind of brings into sharp focus a player that we, we're going to come on to talk about in um, Joel Carvalho, which when we are talking about signings, 
And when it comes to whether this name is known or whether there's a lot of money, it's not an exact science. Uh, was it 13 million that they laid out on Carvalho? Can't say it's been a success, anywhere near a success so far. So big money does not equal success when it comes to signings, which I think this is me not trying to trying to butter up Forest fans and say, don't worry, it'll be all right, because you don't want to see that influx like Mikey saying, where you're just throwing players at a, at a problem to see what happens and see what sticks. Um, you want a coherent squad. And I think you mentioned Fleming, you mentioned uh, Zinc and Nagel. Jack Clark was another one, of course, who is at a stage in his career where he needs to prove himself. Fantastic bursting onto the scene with Leeds, falling away, oh, my, uh, admittedly, a, a club like Spurs, but a couple of loan, um, loan spells which haven't set the world alight. Um, so if, if he is to come in, there's the uh, hopefully the ambition of the draft from the player himself to be the best he can possibly be. And uh, lone players leaving the club, but one's coming back. I, I talk about Brennan a lot, not just because I know his dad, not just because I, I was um, D- uh, David was a, a very good friend and a teammate of mine and, and a, a lovely family. Um, but having um, seen his development and having seen how good he can be, I'm really excited about seeing what he could do. Not trying to put ridiculous pressure on a lad that's got history and heritage with Forrest, but uh, coming in and, and the fans loving him like one of their own because he is. I think there's, there's the chemistry there for him to have a really good and effective season. Um, you'll have seen a bit more of Zink and Agel, perhaps than other fans in the second mm. half of last season. He had a very good record in Norway with Bodo Glimt and then he came to Watford. I think he had five assists in 20 games since January, which is a pretty decent record, but they did mm. go up. I mean, what did you make of him when you saw him? Well, again, a player that can cause the opposition problems and it, go, it dovetails into what Mikey's saying with regards to um, when Forrest maybe have gone a goal down in a game and, and when Forrest have been more um, focused on being solid, which, I mean, they're not the sexiest words in the world, are they? Focused and solid because you want excitement, you want entertainment and, and you want to be in a position where you feel that you're that you're in the game for the for the course of the 90 minutes. If you do go 1-0 down, Zick and Engel's part of a, a team... A successful team. So you're hoping, I think, that if there is that element of of um, reflected glory in the team doing very, very well, that that comes along with the player. Uh, but again, the pressure is on for any of these players that come in to, to be part of a Forest side that when you are looking at the Championship, and we really do hope there's not that growing disparity between the Premier League and the and the uh, and the Championship, and the, and, and the gap grows any bigger than it needs to be, because it's one hell of a fight to get out. But it's a fight that. Forest go in on, on level picking, I think, with at least three quarters of the division. Mm. Where do you let me talk about Carvalho? I mean, no player has divided opinion that I can think of more, Mikey, than, than Carvalho. Perhaps Ryan Yates, I suppose, but I put Carvalho above him. I mean, where do you stand on him? He's back for the season ahead. Is he worth another chance? Uh, yeah, but I'm, I tend to lean towards what, what Brooks is just saying there. So he's had, I think he signed a four-year deal, didn't he? He's had two years with the club now, or should I say a year? He's, he's been on loan. Um, he's hardly ripped it up. However, what I will say is I'd rather see him at number 10 or playing in midfield than some of the options we had last season. So, you know, shoehorning, clearly. Harry played. Hart's performance. Yeah, I did, yeah, exactly. And, you know, somebody like a Cafu who's, useful should i say probably being kind but he's not a number 10 um so i'd rather see carvalho given a chance there until we can either assess you know one is he somebody that can fits in fits into hewton style and what he wants this season uh two if he's not can he play a bit part maybe off the bench or three if he's if he's not in there before we ship him out on loan again or or, or try you know get that permanent sale let's get somebody in who can play that role um who is creative and forward thinking rather than trying to shoe on somebody in that's not that I think we did last season, which is why we struggled to break down teams. So I think if I was, if I was at the club now, I'd want to see him given a chance, of course, but I think I've got to be honest. I don't think he'll be here past the first transfer window. I think, you know, is he, is he one of those that, you know, you go one nil down, and you're, you you're trying to get back in the game, and he's you know he's tracking back, winning the ball. I'm not sure, but mm. that's that's just my opinion. I hope I'm completely wrong, and I hope he comes back and rips it up and plays in behind grabbing like when he first started because he was fantastic for those first few months before he kind of lost his way. So I hope I'm really wrong, but I'd like to see him given a go until we get somebody in 
that's better <laughs> or we, we play in a different way without that number 10 so whether we go two up or you know three at the back and do it away with your inverted wingers um let's just see how things pan out mate well that i mean that's such a good point you're making mikey because we, it seemed like it's when we were covering for, uh, forest and, and talking about them for such a long period of time there was a real reluctance wasn't there to get two up top together and i think um because if you are potentially discussing forest players that for want of a better phrase need to pull the finger out when it comes to what they're actually there to do lewis and lyle given the goal return i think it's 11 between them last season obviously you've got to take into account form fitness etc but um to, to facilitate players that can score goals then it's it's the job of every, everybody around them and the attacking players that go with them whether that's a case of playing with two and having one in behind them or playing in a way where you get i don't know the experience of what lewis has got but the pace of mighton of um brennan on on either side going forward in, in a bit in a, a slightly more attack minded way of play i mean like we've, we've looked at england haven't we we've talked about england and how they set up and what their um, team shape should have been and everyone's oh, look at all the defenders that they've put in but attack wise when they're going forward they were devastating at times and i'm not saying that there's, there's a straight line between an england formation and what forest do on the first day of the season but there's enough players maybe there's the, the gap behind the front line and and the, and the defense where you're looking at um, a big turnaround in low knees that's where the real tinkering feels like it needs to be done but there's plenty there's there's options going forward i just think and i've, I've been intrigued to see what mikey's take on this is it's just how this experienced manager that knows how to get a side from together because um i think as much as we are being pragmatic and realistic is in tweets there's a team that can cause other teams problems what do you want to say to that mikey yeah no i i, I totally agree i think if you go back to to England there was a lot I think I read a stat that said something like we only had 51 shots or something in the tournament which is really really low compared to Italy who had twice as many but that was the way we set up and the way we played and Prutz right used the word devastating I thought we were at times I thought when we let the, the shackles off with England and we and, you know Grealish was on the pitch and Foden and we had sort of you know two in behind one rather than sort of two cutting in from the side I thought we looked absolutely fantastic and weirdly enough I think we tried to do that on Sunday um, if you look at the players that, that ended the game, we just did it a bit too late. Um, so I, th I think with Forrest, um, it wouldn't surprise me at all if if Graben, until they find a solution for that number 10 spot, if they don't think it's Carvalho or they want to play Brennan out wide, which I think he played um, for Lincoln last season, sort of out there cutting in, won't be, wouldn't surprise me at all if, if Graben plays deeper, but certainly for the start of the season. But then again, we need somebody up top. And I, I tell you what, Matt, I, I was gutted when Blackpool went up because I really like that Jerry Yates that they've got up front. Mm. I was mm. kind of hoping they'd stay down and Forrest would go in for him because every time I see him, he looks fantastic. You know, he's young, energetic, plays with his back to goal, but can also sort of burst burst forward quick. I think he scored 20-odd goals last season. He'd have been perfect. But I guess now the price tag's probably quadrupled, I would have thought, for him. Um, so I'm not sure how feasible that is. Um, but I think it wouldn't surprise me if Grabbin drops a bit deeper um, and then they, they push, push Taylor or somebody like that up front to start the season. We'll have to see how it goes, Matt. True, true. Perhaps we lost you for a sec, but you returned in glorious fashion. I agree with everything Mikey just said. Good, good. There's a, I was going to come on to a question for you, so I'm glad you returned. Um, there's an interesting comment from Richard Ot Otway in the, in the Facebook comments here, Prats, about kind of the evolution of the defensive midfield role with how Rice and Phillips, especially Phillips, are quite dynamic, uh, getting around the park more. Mm. Do you think that role's changed? Uh, I suppose Forrest had, <coughs> excuse me, like Ben Watson, who just really did just sit, and players like Makaleli before that, who didn't really get around the park much. Mm. Do you think you can have central midfielders now who aren't quite as athletic and dynamic? Is that role changing, do you think? It's funny because when, I, when you hear... I think it was Roy Keane's take on it when he was talking about players and, and numbers that fit to players and where they can play. And he, he said, what's wrong with the midfield doing what midfielders always did, which was run around, tackle, head the ball, score goals, which I thought was a wonderfully blunt way of putting it. But um, um, I, I think 
what we've seen, I, I mean, there, there, there always has been an elegance to players that play that role in the way that Declan does it or what Calvin's done. And I think the evolution of Calvin as well is, is a real testament to not only the um, ambition and the fight of a player, but what good coaching can do for a, a player that's got the fundamentals. Um, like you say, with the McAuley one sitting in front, uh, but you also look at N'Golo Kante, who um, would be seen as that type of player, but my God, covers a hell of a lot of ground around a football pitch and is, it has the athleticism and the drive to be able to affect a football match. It, I think it really does depend on how you play. If you want to have two that defensive midfielders, then uh, you, you've got to make sure that there's legs, there's energy, there's um, explosiveness around them going forward and you've got and you need fullbacks that are going to work their way up and down a football pitch. But I think um, I think there has been a slight possible evolution in it. But I, I, I always think that any, anybody that would say that they are a midfielder, regardless of what that now entails with when when you are put as a number, you, it always needs that kind of ability to get about a football pitch. And it's I think it, having played there or attempted to try and play there for quite a large period of my career. Always prided yourself on being as as fit and as energetic as possible, and I think the best players, the ones that end up costing lots and lots and lots and lots of money, the ones that um, contribute in all ways, i.e., defensively organising organising uh, the base from which a team attacks from, but also contributing with goals. And I think um, if you get a player that can have a foot in both camps of that, then you've got somebody. Very, very special. And to bring it back to Forest, there's a gap there. Isn't there? There's, there's a gap for someone to step up and take control of, of the Forest midfield. Because if you're looking at, it's a bit of a cliche, have, have they had a general in there in the last season or two? Maybe. But not someone that's really capable of, of, um, of leading the team from the very heartbeat of the team, I think. Yeah, exactly. I was going to bring that back to Forrest. I mean, Richard's point here, Mikey, is that Forrest don't have that without James Garner. And he mentioned Sam Bissau, who was quite dynamic, but had glass knees, unfortunately. Could Ryan Yates be that player? He mentions Yates, uh, Colback and Cafu as the options at the moment. Could Yates be a general? It's a big step up, but does he have that about him? Uh yeah, massive step up. I'm not sure at this point in time you'd want to sort of rely and put all your eggs in one basket with, with Ryan, to be honest with you. But I think it depends on, and Prox made a good point, it depends on the mix and whether you play the two or the one. So for me, I don't know, Cafu, Colback, Yates, they're all very similar. So mm. do we have, as Prox was saying, you know, a general, do we have somebody that will run as Calvin Phillips did? Um in the, in the tournament just passed. I think he outran pretty much everybody in, in the England team every single game. So it, it's just up and down. Do we have that person? Yates could potentially do that, but he, he's, he sits too deep for me. So I guess it's about the mix. If we brought somebody in to do a Ben Watson role, whether that's whether we ask Colback to do that next season, for example, or we bring somebody in, that could free Yates up to do that and to take more, more, of, a, more of a lead sort of going forward. But my only worry is, he does miss like a sitter a game, doesn't he? So, mm. <laughs> not sure I want him anywhere near the opposition box, to be honest. But <laughs> I think it's just it's just a mix, isn't it? I mean, Ryan for me is is really really useful. Um, I don't know. Let me give you an example. So you won the up away from home with half an hour to go. Ryan Yates will be crucial at that point, getting tackles in, putting his body on the line, blocking. Um, another scenario, maybe not so much, but it's about having those options in the squad. So I think he can step up, and he's only young. You've got to remember, what is he, 23, 24? 24, yeah. yeah. I think he's old. So, you know, he is, he is going to get better. But again, it's it's whether he has people behind him or in front of him that allow him to do the role that, that Chris wants him to do at Forest. So we'll, we'll, we'll see, I guess. But I've got high hopes for him, and he's one that we should stick by because he is, he is one of our own. And we give a lot of hard time to a lot of players, and I don't think the things that people say about Ryan is, is warranted to be honest because I tell you what he does do he gives 100% every game and I mm. think you can ask the question whether everybody did that for every game last season that's all I'm mm. yeah. I think it, it, it's it's always I don't know because um, and God forbid I'm, I'm drawing a, a, a similarity with between um, myself and, and Ryan Yates because I'm sure Ryan would probably have his head in his hands thinking please don't do that but when it comes to Exactly what Mikey's saying. And those things will never go out of fashion. Being, being part of 
uh, a team and, and caring about what you do. But the, the flip side of it is you, you can't, if you are a fan, and this, this is me not trying to tell a Forest fan how to judge a Forest player, but you can't damn a player for what he can't do. Do you know what I mean? If 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 he if he suddenly hits on 12, 15 goals a season from midfield, from 22, 23, you are kind of going, well, what have you been doing for the last few seasons? But you're also going, wow, that's amazing. But on the flip side of it is, the, it should, the expectation levels of a player, and this is me not dialing down the expectations of Forest fans or for, their, or, or for what they want their players to be for that football club at all. But it's, it's asking, um, we talked about Carvalho. Uh, Joao, can you do, can you do a, a, a holding role and start dogging about and, 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 and putting tackles in and putting players on the, on the backsides? Probably not, no, because he, spent, he likes to spend more time at the tip of a midfield, being in and around um, uh, the creative side of the game. So let's not damn him for what he can do. Let's try and, I hesitate to use a celebrate, but, but appreciate what he can do, what he can bring to a side. It, there's a familiarity there with the Ryan Yates that, as Mike says, play, uh, manager uh, fans can know he's going to do exactly what he says on the tin, get about a football pitch, do as much as he possibly can, maybe chip in with the odd goal. But that's when the chemistry of a team needs to come in with with um, the personnel that come in and around a player such as that. It's, it's, it's a fascinating kind of thought process and a fascinating way of how fans deal with players such as Ryan Yates, who strikes me as relatively inoffensive and one that wouldn't cause too much consternation or trouble within a, within a football club. But I mean, not, I'm not just saying get behind him because he's nice, because that's ridiculous. He's a professional footballer that needs to uh, be judged as a professional footballer. But judge him on what he can do, not necessarily what he can't. I spoke to John McGovern the other week at this uh, the Samantha Bursal's charity game. Perhaps, and he said That's he a jump from, from Ryan Yates to European Cup winning John McGovern. You've done well there. I'm going to link it back to David <laughs> Prutton as well. You'll like this. He said wow. he didn't understand uh, the central midfield role until he was 27. He didn't fully understand the game. Obviously, Ryan's 22, 23, 24. Was there a point in your career where you really got it, as in terms you were comfortable with your role? Did that come at a certain age, do you think, or not? I think it comes with maturity and, and, and consistency of selection and form and, and fitness. Um, it's funny because as you get older and kind of, got your head round training, what you're doing during the week and good managers would come and, and drop a little a couple of seeds in here and there when it when it comes to knowing what your job could possibly be come the next match day. Then you kind of got your head round being able to, con- without using some kind of corporate speak type thing, you're controlling the controllables because it is, as much as you want to play well, it's quite obviously another 21 players on that pitch that, well, obviously, you'd like to think that the other 10 on your side want you to play well as well. They're going to do as much as they possibly can. But there's another 11 that want absolutely the opposite thing. Um, and as long as you're comfortable with that and knowing what you can bring to that game and overcome those obstacles, which are part and parcel of everyday life for a footballer, then you felt more comfortable doing that. Also, you felt comfortable playing with certain players. I remember coming into the team very early on and playing with Andy Johnson, who, of course, is crackers. Um, but he was he was a wonderful teammate, a really really good teammate, and who stood up for you, was was there at your side, chivied you along. Um, Chris Bart Williams was very much um, forget the carrot. I've got a load of sticks here to make sure that you play as best as you possibly can, um, and was very uh, give you short shrift if you weren't very good in a particular game, which again spurred you on to be better. And then as you, as we got as we developed and. Um, say you're in the team with JJ or Gareth Williams or Reading and, and people like that, You there was a common ground there that you were all kind of younger players coming together and, and sharing something very, very special. But um, it, it's 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 imperative that whatever position you're playing, you've got very clear outlines from a manager, but also very clear desires and ambitions that, from what you want in every single specific training session, every, every single specific game. Because what it is, as much as I'm talking about um, no, I don't, I'm not canvassing for Forest fans to be unequivocal in their love for Ryan Yates. All I'm saying is that um, put the ball back in his court. You know what I mean? We want you to do well, do well for us. And the way he does well for himself is by taking control of his professional career each and every game that he plays in and each and every season he, he plays in and sticks to what he's good at. And if he's good at getting up and down the pitch, make sure you get up and down the pitch more than anyone else. If you're good at 
trying to start attacks or get them in the crosses or you think you can be good at getting them in the crosses, practice that, become better at that. Ask the manager what he wants from you all the time to get the best out of, of, of yourself. So it's uh, it does come a little bit with uh, maturity. I said relative maturity. We are talking about footballers. But the... Um, the way and, and the comfort that comes from knowing that your position is your position and you can flourish in it. Uh, I just want to take a few listener questions before we uh, have to go. Uh, this one's probably one for you, Mikey. Uh, Greg asks about signing a right back or is Jenkinson good enough to be given a run? I think Jenkinson's been told he can move on if he can find a club, which kind of leaves you with, as it stands, Jordan Gabriel. Would you... Be happy with that. We were talking earlier about a young a player who can get up and down the line. He's 22 and he can do that. Is he worth a chance or do you think they have to get someone in? No, I'd get Gabriel a chance if I'm honest. I think I said this on a previous episode. I, I would rather um, the players cut their teeth at a lower level like he's done. He's done really well um, in a team that got... He was at Blackpool, wasn't he? I'm sure he was. A team that yeah. got promoted. Um, and now this is his chance. So let's give him a go because... If he hits the ground running and he's really good, how much money and effort and, and time is that going to save us in terms of a club bringing somebody else in? Or we can spend a hell of a lot of money doing what we did last season uh, and, and and you know getting somebody to drop down a division from the Premier League to come play right back for us. I'd, I'd prefer to see um, Gabriel given a chance, to be honest, as I would with some of the other um, younger players that we've got. Can I just also say, Matt, as well, because I'm getting a lot of stick on text here. Um, the, um, I think Martin Johnson and Carvalho and even Joe Lolly, three out of those four um, in behind a striker is quite exciting. And I probably didn't stress that enough. So, you know, it's all right me going on about playing a, a young right back. I think we should give the younger players the chance to start the season in behind that striker as well. So Carvalho is a bit 50-50, we can debate about him, but Mighton and Johnson, absolutely. And you've got to remember Joe Lolly as well coming back from an injury. If we get the Joe Lolly we had the other season, mm. well, there's there's 15 goals for you straight mm. away. So there's, there's a lot to be positive about. And I think we just need to be brave. It's the start of the season. Let's go to some of these kids that have cut their teeth at lower levels and see if they're, if they're up to it. Mike, you make a great point there as well. And... Um whoever's getting in touch with you is making a fantastic point as well because it's there. there is there's a bit of a preconception that you want players to take risks further at the pitch which is absolutely right you want solidity at the back you want a, re a resilience and a reliance on a, a way of stopping the opposition but what naturally can come with younger players is that fearlessness is that willingness to take a chance is that willingness to, to put themselves out there to 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 create something out of nothing. And I think you're absolutely right. If you can all indulge that to the right degree going forward, you know, with those players knowing that they've got security of, of of solidity behind them, then that's when that chemistry of the team starts to work in a way that can create goals. Because as you said, and, and so very, very right, and having seen a hell of a lot of Forest games um, over the past season and, and, and going further back, there is the element of creativity which has been lacking. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that's easy at all from a player that wasn't remotely creative to watch players do it. It was something that I was always very respectful of and, and appreciative of. Because if you are, if, if you're classing yourself as a dog of war, you need someone else to be able to finesse things going forward. Otherwise, you get 11 lads terrorising around, not really topping players and not really doing much. But that, that's when... Um, that element of going forward and, and the slight naivety that comes with uh, younger players can work in, in Forest's favour. And, and I tell you what would happen with that is you'd have a set of fans there very, very open-minded to the fact of let's give these kids a chance that are looking to affect a football match in a positive way. Not come on the pitch, not to lose, to come on a pitch to try and win a football match. And let's give them the freedom to, to express themselves because I think that's absolutely paramount when they're playing at the City ground. Who's giving you stick, Mikey? Is oh, it your wife on the text? No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. It's friend Mike. He's a uh, he's very passionate about giving these younger players a chance, and I, I think Prutz is absolutely right as well. You know, after the sort of eighteen months everybody in the world's had, wouldn't it be really refreshing to go down to the city ground and see, you know, a load of young, athletic, energetic players with no fear? You know, with a couple of older heads behind them, a Ben Watson in, in a role or whatever, you know, somebody like that, with the remit of get out on that football pitch, 
enjoy yourself, affect the game, score some goals, which would be nice. Um, <laughs> people would love to see that. You know, nobody's been out for a year and a half. So wouldn't it be great if we if we made a great start to the season and had that had that sort of em, um, emphatic sort of way to play play the game, which will be completely different from what we saw last season. So I'm just I've just got my fingers crossed that that we go down that route. Um, it might be a question from this Mike, which I'm going to link into another question <laughs> for you, Mike. And he specifically asked you, so I'm guessing this is this is your mate asking about Lyle Taylor, and I want to link that to another question we had from uh, Andrew Brooks on Twitter asking about uh, a player who you know, maybe is on the outs at the moment who who could kind of turn their city ground career around. I've already cited Jack Cole back a few times on this, but what do you think about Taylor, Mikey? And is there another player, if it's not him, who could turn it around? Um, uh, choose my words carefully. I, th I think, I think last season there were a couple of strikers available, weren't they? There was, you know, Ivan Tony that went for big money to Brentford, what was it, five, six million? Um, whatever Peterborough do, by the way, we need to do that. They're amazing, <laughs> absolutely amazing, absolutely unbelievable stuff. Um, and there was a few more that was dotted around, and we obviously t took a, a punt on somebody that you know, let his contract run down, there's issues around that. And, you know, got in the team and I just, I'm just a little bit disappointed, not just with him and not having a go at one player. Um, but I just, I just think that perhaps it was the wrong decision from all concerned. And I don't necessarily see how he he fits in going forward. He, he, I seem to remember him at Charlton, he was rampaging striker, good at holding the ball up, Scored some goals. That's a great penalty, by the way. Brilliant penalty that he takes. Um, and, and I saw him down the, down the sit ground when they beat us 1 0, you know, after the Leeds game when everybody was on a high and then quickly battered back down again. Um, and I think, I'm sure he played up front for them and he was fantastic. In fact, no, I think he scored and he was mm. fantastic. So, what, so when we signed him, I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I, I did think, okay, he, he could be quite useful. But I think him, along with a few others last season, uh, were disappointing to say the least, and I think if we do have a chance to freshen up uh, that area of the pitch, as, as I said earlier, and, and Prutz was saying, I think we should do that, and that probably includes letting a few leave, like Lyle and a few others. Uh, and, and, and Matt, I think I was going to say Jack Cole back as well. Um, you know, we talked about having that experienced head just sitting mm. in front of the back four, unless we bring somebody in that can do that and allow. Your Johnson and your Yates and players like that to have a little bit more freedom. Um, we we will, we probably should start the season with Jack Colback there. And he didn't have the best season last season, you know, not many of them did, but he's proven over the past few years he's, he's a quality operator at this level. So I'd like to see him given a chance back in the team um, to show what he can do. Yeah, so mm. Colback. Mm. Can you write a player off after one season, Prots? Um, yeah, yeah, I'm not saying you should, but you can. Yeah, if, if a, a striker's always judged on goals. Uh, we've we've changed. Sorry, I, I say striker. We've changed the vernacular around players that are in that position now. We call them forwards, which means that they can get away with not scoring goals. But if they're not scoring goals, they need to bring a hell of a lot to the team going forward and uh, facilitate other players scoring goals. Because Lyle came in with a with a reputation, with a with a, a reputation of a goal scorer, with the confidence of a goal scorer. And whether whether the, the the formation of the team and the performance of the player have got to meet a bit more in the middle remains to be seen. But I think Mike is absolutely right. A, a player that quite clearly and refreshingly, I think, backs himself to be as good as he possibly can. Um, I think if, if a striker of any, of any worth of salt would say that that, is, that hasn't happened. Um, and there are people to, um, people to prove wrong. There are people to show particularly at this level, that he can do it. Uh, as we saw with Lewis, we've seen Lewis score goals at this level for such, such a long period of time. And when he doesn't, for Forrest, that's when they struggle. Um, so there's, there's definitely Lyle with a, with a point to prove. Cavalli, we've already mentioned, if he gets him, himself in the side, then show us what you, what you can do with regards to goal scoring and, and assists and being creative. Um, it, it's it's fascinating, and, and this probably—I mean, obviously, we, we spoke about Dan Murphy coming in and recruitment, and I know recruitment is is such a vague, such a vague word, and it it it, it can cover a multitude of sins. It can it can blind people into thinking that that things have gone right, or that or, or be a vague reason for why things haven't gone right. 
Norwich City, and I, I must have mentioned and bored people with this before, um, got up off the back twice of, 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 of two players that cost one and a half million pounds collectively and Emi Buendia and Timo Pukki. Timo Pukki cost nothing. That was a free transfer for them. And it's phenomenal. Yes, I understand different setup, different expectations, different ability to uh, finance a football club, different running of a football club. I do understand everything that goes into that, but it just goes to show players are out there. Players are out there that, sh- that should be looking at a, at a club and again, forgive me for going to yesteryear for this, of a European Cup winning football club with history and heritage, with a wonderful stadium, with with the following that they've got and think, why why on earth are we getting players like that? Why, why can't we get a player that does that? And like I said, I, I, I don't know the first thing about who signs exactly off on the dotted line when it comes to uh, Forest signings or which players um, the, this team and this club is going after, but there are out there. That's, that's why there's, especially in this day and age, post, not even post pandemic, coming to the uh, the bitter end of what we've all gone through. The, if the due diligence is done with the right players uh, and the right personnel in charge, gems like that can be found. But this, the, just to go back to the start of the question, there are, as a whole, I think there might be one or two bright spots from last season for Nottingham Forest. But as a club, as a squad, completely, completely underperformed and everyone that's ready to go on the first kick of the ball on the first weekend needs to start putting that right. Uh, one last viewer question before we move on to the other topic I want to discuss. It's an interesting one. It's for you, Prutz, from uh, Richard Ottaway. Um, yourself, Dawson, Genus, Harewood, Reed, Leicester, they all came back to the club, all their, their kids have. Richard asked, is there mm. something special from that time that made you all come back for a second go at it? Yeah, definitely. I, I, I think it's, it's wonderful to see when you see the lads go back and you see what um, affinity that they're held in. Um, I'd like to think I, I'd not completely shot all that goodwill to pieces by, A, obviously we mentioned the playoff semi-final, which that was wonderful that it got in within three minutes. And the fact that, um, horrifyingly, I don't predict Forrest to win every single week and every single game that they play in over the course of a championship season. It's not done with any, when I say, I don't think there's a win on the cards. There's no malice. There's, I bear no ill will at all. But it was a really special time, and I, I've got. And as you get, it becomes more, it becomes more special as you get older because it, the chemistry and, and the dynamics of a football club and a, and a, and a dressing room and as straightforward as you think. A lot of blocks together playing football. Boom, that's great. Because I played in some awful dressing rooms where people just didn't like each other. But the Forest team that I was involved in back then was wonderful. Absolutely. Wonderful, led by Paul Hart, who, again, we've, you've spoken to him on here, man, and, and you know exactly what he's like, and a, a wonderful leader of younger men and, and, and men that are getting into a stage of the career where they can make a serious dent in what football means to them. Um, and I think there, there was a real magic and a chemistry. And going back to the very, very first question that you said to Mikey about losing in the playoffs and uh, what England have gone through is, I think the thing that sticks out, because I remember I'd, I'd left for Southampton by that point, but was watching the, 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 the semi-final against Sheffield United, was that is a potentially, and, and as, as it's been proved over the last 20 plus years, um, a future defining football match. That could have seen Forrest back in the Premier League relatively quickly. And now we're looking at a generation of football fans Forest fans that have seen this team fart around in League One, you know what I mean, and and, and been uh, and had seasons where they've they've looked at Huddersfield go up, Hull City go up, Blackpool go up, and I, and again I mean this with the greatest respect for football clubs going up into the Premier League and and, and showing what they can do, and Bournemouth going up, a, a, a Bournemouth club that you would look at at the turn of the century, kind of sorry, they're going to spend half a decade in the very top division of English football and make a really decent fist of it, so. So that's that's the context that you're putting in. And there was a real special bunch of players that had a real chance there. And it's only history and the benefit of hindsight, which goes to show how monumental that loss turned out to be. That's, that's not me saying that group of players should have done better, but that it goes to show that you put it in the history of, of following a team like this, as Mikey does, and his, his mate Mike and everyone that he hangs around with that's called Mike can, uh, can, can attest to. Because it, it's when you're wedded to a football club, as proper fans are, you do look at key moments and you think, oh, but just got that one right. The last 20 years might have been a, <laughs> a very different story, might not they? Uh, I just wanted to finish then talking about getting it right. Uh, present day championship, 
Um, we're quite a way out from the season starting, but you can probably have a bit of insight around who's going to be up there and who's going to be joining Derby in League One next season. Um, <laughs> can't see them staying Ooh. up. Can you? Oh. Well, I mean, it, well by, dig, by, but... by virtue of the fact that they've got about six players, they're going to have one hell of a, hell of a challenge ahead. And they don't get the recruitment right, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, perhaps you see a lot of the championship. I'll let you go first. Who are you thinking is going to be up there and who are you thinking might struggle? I know we're a bit far out, but any yeah. thoughts? Well, I'm intrigued to see. I think Bournemouth have pretty much set the stall out, obviously showing uh, what they want to do, bringing Scott in. Um you look at traditionally the teams that have come down, how Sheffield United react to the way that the season finished. Are they going to do what Norwich City did? I think Norwich came down losing the last 10 games uh, and then obviously got the finger out pretty quickly back in the championship and showed everyone what they can do. West Brom, another one with Valerian. What, what type of... What's he going to do with that squad of players? Is he going to change what he did... With Barnsley, is he going to find a different dynamic of player that he's got to deal with to get absolute buy-in from from who he's got there? Um, teams that were decent but died off. Look at Reading. Obviously, they've lost players to Bayern Munich, and obviously Michael Elise has moved on as well. It was such a wonderful player for them. So I think again, when you talk about what we'd seen from the from the division last season with the teams that have come down, I think it ended up looking like what we possibly thought it would, but I think it was open for long patches of time before those those kind of playoff and automatic spots were completely nailed down. As, as, for, as for the teams that need to be a bit wary, you always look at teams that have come up from the division below that should look at consolidation. But the Derby story, and don't worry, I'm not over-egging this just because we've got Forest fans listening. That, I mean, that's that's... The more you try and dig out what's going on and, and where they could possibly be and what they're trying to do or what their aims are for the season with the manager who's quite clearly ambitious, but I still think relatively unproven because you look at who went down and it was, it what it, it didn't, obviously there were scenes of celebration as, as that final game against Wednesday finished, but you do get the feeling that that, that was tinged with, well, not tinged, that was a wash with relief because relief from the point of view of getting away with the season that they'd had. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll be very intrigued to see what goes on with that. And then you've to bring it back to Forest and where they should be aiming for, it, it's it's got to be another season where, like possibly 20 other sides in the division, top six is absolutely manageable because because it is. Because it, it is as, as, as wide a spectrum of results as you could possibly see over the course of a season. And it is relentless. And as long as he gets the makeup of the squad right, to give themselves a fighting chance of being part of a team, one of the teams that is, is fighting in the top 10 and above. Uh, Mikey, I'll let you finish us uh, for this week then. I mean, what do you think about teams that are going to be good, teams are going to be bad, and a very early Forest prediction? Yeah, Prox talking about the, the playoff defeat, she brought all those memories back now. <laughs> That's why it's been a bit <laughs> quiet. <laughs> No. So um, I'm not bothered about Forest as long as we don't get in the playoffs because I can't I can't handle that again. <laughs> um, I think um, Prutz's points around the teams that have come down from the Premier League, yeah, absolutely. Because not just the parachute payments, but the quality of the squads that they have, they're going to be up, up there. So who have we got? Fulham, uh, right down here, Sheffield United, uh, West Brom. Yeah, they're absolutely going to be up there. I think... Um, I'm allowed one dig at Derby. So I saw they've got a load of uh, players on trial. Um, if you look at some of the names, it looks like a decent squad if it was like 2010, because they're all, you know, they're, they're all players that you probably wouldn't uh, choose as your first choice. And it kind of gives you the impression of the mess that, that Derby are in. So I know you joked at the start, Matt, around um, who's going down with Derby. I'll be honest, I was looking at the table this this morning. I was struggling to find any teams that I think would struggle as much as them. So I've wrote down Hudders, Huddersfield, um, maybe one of the teams that, that have gone up. So I don't know, Hull, but I'm guessing I didn't really see that much of Hull, to be honest with you. So so I think, but the thing is, the championship is such a weird league. So you can go 10 games without losing and then not win for three months. It, it, it's, it is just like that. And I think as long as Forest make a decent start, and set their stall out and do the business early, 
there's absolutely no reason why we can't be up there so yeah realistically um we want to be aiming for the top half and as long as we're nicely placed around the turn of the year that would give the guys running the club some encouragement about maybe strengthening further to give us that one last push but i think from a forest fan perspective i'll just be happy with a season where we're not struggling we play some attractive football the team age is reduced i think it was 28 and a half last season so team age is reduced significantly which in theory means we'll get more energy into the team um more goals a lot more younger lads being given a chance that's kind of what i want to see so just a positive season for forest but you'll be hard pressed in terms of going up to look beyond the teams that have come down if i'm honest so i think my tip is probably full of more west brom yep i agree with that i think hollow under embargo aren't they um which might hamper them a little bit i think for so they can only sign freeze at the moment right i think we'll end it there i can see my children are almost literally scratching at the door to get there <laughs> well you feed you feed them as well in the holiday what <laughs> I parachuted my mom in and she's like I can hear her saying he's not done yet he's not done yet so um, yes we better end it there and uh, get some lunch for my children before the social services are on so right <laughs> thanks to everyone who uh, watched along uh, on Facebook and everyone who listens on iTunes ever do give us a good review and rating because it does certainly help us uh, Mikey thank you very much and Prutz thank you very much as ever pleasure anytime Excellent. Much appreciated as normal. And we shall see everyone soon.